Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you enjoy this legal educational content, and today's the day I earn that subscription. For today's case, we turn our attention to an oral argument in a case that I've been waiting for basically my entire professional life, because it concerns a case in the 80s called Chevron versus NRDC, which I loathe. So to begin to, un to understand this case, we must first turn our attention to Chevron so that I can explain to you the precedent that if fate is kind, will cease to exist. Chevron was a unanimous decision by the U.S. Supreme Court in the 80s dealing with Chevron, the oil company. Chevron, the oil company, among other things, owns refineries that help to refine crude oil into its many products that be can become more useful. The NRDC is a non-for-profit that deals with environmental issues. The NRDC sued Chevron relating to environmental issues. The Clean Air Act, among other provisions, deals with, in, deals with clean air as it relates to pollution that occurs from a pollution source. Now, there is some ambiguity about what a pollution source is, and this was the problem that sort of came to the attention of the course. What is a pollution source? So two different methods were suggested as possible, although I think there are other ones. But there are two, there were two major methods of determining what a pollution source is. One might be the plant as a whole. Chevron all owns a couple different plants, or at least has an interest in plants, or if not Chevron, then someone else. Nothing about this deals with Chevron. Of course, Chevron's just the party in question, but it's not fundamentally about Chevron. So forgetting Chevron for just a second, the company, consider any oil refinery, any oil refinery. There's a number of oil, oil refineries. The oil refinery as a whole might be considered a pollution source. Or in the alternative, an individual stack that emits pollution might be considered a pollution source. So if you consider this, again, moving past the issue of an oil refinery into potentially other contexts, you could imagine that the smoke that comes out of a smokestack could be measured, for example, with its particulate co contaminations, or you might consider all the smokestacks that occur on a piece of property. And then even depending on the nature of the land, you might even have questions about what the property is, depending on how it's arranged, right? It might not just necessarily be one stack after another. It might be, you know, a stack over here, and then a stack over here, and a stack on a different plot of land, a stick stock on a different plot of land. Maybe they're a couple miles apart, whatever, right? So do you consider like all that as an amalgamated whole or do you consider each stack unto itself? Now, either way you go about it does potentially have problems and potentially adverse consequences depending on what you're trying to do. So there are potentially negative ramifications even to the environmentalists depending on how you're measuring it. But, you know, this was the fight, right? Do This was the fight. Do we measure it on the, the plant as a whole level or do we measure, measure it stack by stack? And each stack, for example, does each stack have to comply with the EPA, or is it okay if we have a lot of stacks that don't comply with the EPA, but as a combination of stacks, they do, right? So we might have some very, very polluting stacks, but as long as we have enough efficient stacks to compensate for it, maybe that's okay, All right? So that's sort of the fight, all right? Now, the Supreme Court in nine to zero didn't really, the EPA for its part had an interpretation. I forget which one it was, and for the purposes of this exercise, I don't care. So the EPA said one of the two things, and I don't really care which. All right, so Chevron has a point of view, NRDC has a point of view, and the EPA has a point of view about this thing. All right, so it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they say in a nine in its unanimous decision, they say it's up to the administrative agency to determine what the law means with respect to pollution and basically anything else that any other administrative is issue could do, right? Of course, this isn't ultimately about the EPA. The EPA is sort of irrelevant to this equation. The Clean Air Act at the end is sort of irrelevant to this equation because we're doing sort of a meta-analysis now about all agencies and all legislation and all regulations, right? So who gets to decide? This is fundamentally a who gets to decide question by the, NR by the Supreme Court in Chevron. Now, the Supreme Court famously wrote in Marbury versus Madison, that was emphatically the province of the judicial branch to determine what the law is. It's like literally carved in stone 
at the U.S. Supreme Court how important it is. But for reasons that pass my understanding and have always passed my understanding, the Supreme Court basically kicked the issue from the Supreme Court, not only to the EPA and not only with respect to this issue, but all administrative agencies with respect to all issues. And so that doesn't really make sense to me. It doesn't make sense because we're trying to figure out what the Congress wrote. What did they mean by pollution source? Now, someone has to figure out what this means, but we're letting the administrative agency that's tasked with enforcing it determine what it means, which doesn't really make sense, right? Because you would imagine that the EPA is going to adopt, and for that matter, any other administrative agency, is going to adopt whatever interpretation is broadest and gives the most, most broad power. But it actually got a little bit worse than that because there were some follow-on cases that come off Chevron's back called Our in one case and Brand X in another case. Okay, So one of these cases dealt with regulations and going on the back of Chevron said administrative agencies get to determine what their own regulations mean. That's nice. That's a nice trick, right? So they get to write the regulations. They get to be the legislature and also the judicial branch and also the executive branch all rolled up into one because they wrote the they wrote the they wrote the thing they wrote the regulation so that makes them the legislature they interpret the thing that makes them the judiciary branch and they enforce the thing that makes them the executive branch what a nice thing right all three rolled up into one how nice and then one of the other cases our brand x i always forget which is which but it's not really important also said i think it was our but they said not only do they get to decide, but they get to change their mind, which is just a big because that's not normally how that works. Right. Normally, that's you can't just get the administrative agency to change it for works. So as new administrations have come and gone and the administrations have changed from Democrat to Republican, it has been known to happen on occasion that the administrative agencies will take literally the exact opposite position on a piece of legislation or a piece of legislation or a regulation, as the case may be, than they did before. They'll flip 180 degrees. And this apparently is totally fine. And it even leads to this somewhat bizarre situation where the administrative agencies get to overrule the Supreme, overrule the, overrule the courts of appeal, which is just bizarre. Because that's, how does an administrative agency get to overrule a, a, uh, a court of appeals? How can they do that? But we've had cases where people have challenged this under a then prevailing regulation and the court of appeals said well you know chevron says you know what it says so the epa wins or whoever it happens to be at the time right and then a subsequent administration came on and changed the rule backwards and it's like hey fifth circuit or whatever circuit it happens to be at the time hey fifth circuit you previously said the law was this and they went backwards and that's how you got the like idea of our and brand x so it's like yeah they can change their mind that's fine too so they can actually wind up overruling precedent from the Court of Appeals. This doesn't make any sense to me. This doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, that's not normally how we do law. The courts, the courts get to interpret what law is. It's emphatically the province of the courts to determine what the law is. And courts can certainly change their mind, but that's their role. That's their role. And the Supreme Court can change its mind. And if God willing, they're going to change their mind today because this is some bullshit. So my view is that the administrative agency's view of what the law is, is a view to take into consideration along with anyone else who happens to be relevant as you're interpreting the law. Like a, a well-horned justice should obviously take the legal opinion of the administrative issue, administrative agency into analysis as they're giving legal analysis. I mean, just because it's the admin agency writing, it doesn't make them wrong, right? So it doesn't make them wrong. And they certainly are well-versed in the issues that confront them in particular. So they know how this law is actually affecting things on the ground, perhaps more than anyone else. So they have a subject matter expertise that is informative. But at the end of the day, it's only informative. And it is not binding. So my view is the somewhat apparently controversial opinion that ultimately it should be the court that determines what the law means, and that should just be the law until either Congress changes it or the court is convinced they've made a mistake. 
It shouldn't be the administrative agencies that just can just change things on a dime because it's more convenient for them. And this case, perhaps more than any other, has led to the current administrative state as we know it today. Because these cases, Chevron, Auer, and Brand X, the trifecta of evil, as far as I'm concerned, right? The trifecta of evil, as far as I'm concerned, is the thing that has bloated up the administrative state. Because now suddenly they don't need to go to Congress. They don't even need to go to themselves anymore. They can just change whatever it is at a, at, on a whim, essentially. And as long as it's not, you know, flatly contradicted by the text, they're going to be upheld. So cases overruling admin agencies with Chevron deference are far and few between. They have to try really hard, right? So as it basically, as long as it's any reasonable interpretation, even if it con contradicts an interpretation before, because that's certainly possible, both something and its exact opposite might be reasonable, right? Maybe a stack, maybe it is reasonable to say that the pollution source is a stack. Maybe it is reasonable to say it's the entire plant. Maybe both positions are reasonable. But, you know, it means one thing or the other. You know, it can't mean both. It means something. And they can't just flip their mind whenever it depends what they ever they want to do at the time. It's some absolute total bullshit. So I want this law to come to an end because I think it's total bullshit. And hopefully if fate is kind, this, this will do it. Chevron will die. And I think that means that our and Brand X come along for the ride, I would imagine. But we'll see. And if that happens, I will be a very happy camper because it will severely curtail the administrative agencies. The administrative agencies will only be able to do what Congress gave them power to do, which is often a lot, but still, they'll actually have to work within the box. Maybe Congress will actually have to pass a law occasionally. Wow, you know, because Congress doesn't have to pass a law because the admin agencies can just do whatever they want. So Congress doesn't even have to do its job. So maybe this will make Congress actually do its job because they'll actually have to change the law occasionally. Amazing, wow, deep. So. With all that wonderful background in place, we turn our attention to the case of Looper Bright Enterprises versus the Secretary of Commerce. Now, let me just read the actual, the actual um, facts of the case and the question presented just as it relates to the specific case. So here, here are the facts. I mean, it doesn't really matter in the end because we're just trying to determine if Chevron's good law but let's pretend it matters for a second and talk about what this case is theoretically about, not that it really matters. All right. So the facts of this particular case are thus. A group of commercial fishermen, and that's sort of why we have the graphic we do, and incidentally, big shout out to Tony for that thumbnail, kick ass, keep producing good thumbnails. A group of commercial fishermen who regularly participate in the Atlantic herring fishery sue the National Marine Fisher Service after the service promulgated, which is to say, created a, regula a regulation in form of the rule that required the industry to fund an at-sea monitoring pro program and an estimated cost of $710 per day. So we're concerned about fishing. We're concerned about overfishing. We're concerned about, you know, the seas. We want you to monitor things on your boat. And this is going to cost $710 a day if we do it. The fishermen argued that the Monson Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act of 1976, and this is the first time I ever heard of the act, so not so much on the fishing for me, I guess, did not authorize the service to create industry-funded monitoring programs, and the service failed to follow the rulemaking progress. The district court grants summary judgment for the government based on its reasonable interpretation of its authority and adoption of the rule through the required notice and comment procedure, the U.S. Court of Appeals affirmed. Thus, the question presented, does the Magnus Stevens Act authorize the National Marine Fisher Service to promulgate a rule that would require industry to pay for at-sea monitoring? And the far more important question, should the court overrule Chevron versus National Resource Defense Council or at least clarify whether statutory silence on controversial Paris creates ambiguity. Please overrule Chevron. Please no half measures. Please just make it go away. I beg you. I beg you. Please just overrule it. No half measures. Just end it. End it now. I beg you. I beg you with all that's in me. 
Let's now turn our attention to the oral arguments and see how we go. We got Paul Clement arguing for Looper. So you know we're in for a good time. Paul Clement is one of the best Supreme or advocates alive. It's a short list, and Paul Clement is certainly at the top of it. So Paul Clement arguing this is about as good as it gets. He is the best. He's one of the best. It's a pretty short list. People you can say are as good as Paul Clement. So Paul Clement arguing the cause. Bring it, Paul. Bring bring your A game. I'm here for it. You're the best. You're arguably the best Supreme Court advocate that exists. Bring your game. Tell us how it's going. Let's see. We'll hear argument next in case 22451, Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo. Mr. Clement. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. This case well illustrates the real-world cost of Chevron, which do not fall exclusively on the Chevrons of the world, but injure small businesses and individuals as well. Commercial fishing is hard. Space on board vehicle vessels is tight, and margins are tighter still. Therefore, for, the, for, the, for my clients, having to carry federal observers on board is a burden, but having to pay their salaries is a crippling blow. Congress recognized as much by strictly limiting the circumstances in which domestic fishing vessels could be saddled with monitoring costs and capping them at 2 to 3 percent of the value of the catch. But the agency here showed no such restraint, requiring monitoring on 50 percent of the trips at a cost of up to 20 percent of their annual returns. Nonetheless, the court below deferred to the agency because it viewed the statute as silent on the who pays question. There is no justification for giving the tie to the government or conjuring agency authority from silence. Both the APA and constitutional avoidance principles call for de novo review, asking only what's the best reading of the statute. Asking instead, is the statute ambiguous, is fundamentally misguided. The whole point of statutory construction is to bring clarity, not to identify ambiguity. The government defends this practice not as the best reading of the APA, but by invoking stare decisis. That is doubly problematic. First, at issue here is only Chevron's methodology, which is entitled to reduced stare decisis effect. We have no beef with Chevron's Clean Air Act holding, and we could not take issue with its APA holding because it failed to mention that statute. But second, all the traditional stare decisis factors point in favor of overruling Chevron's methodology. The doctrine is unworkable as its critical threshold question of ambiguity is hopelessly ambiguous. It is also a, a reliance-destroying doctrine because it facilitates agency flip-flopping. So the reality here is the Chevron two-step has to go and should be replaced with only one question. What is the best reading of the statute? I welcome the court's questions. You know, this is my O face right now. Ah, oh, man, just, he's so good. He's so good. Woof. In my fan even in my fantasies I'm not this good. Holy shit. Even in my fantasies I'm not this good. Man, this guy is an absolute beast. Woof. Uh -huh. Mr. Clement, you uh heard the government's uh the general uh general's arguments uh with respect use of, of mandamus as a basis for uh sort of uh de deference. Uh, could you comment on that? Because my understanding of mandamus is that the duty has to be clear before it uh, actually lies. Uh, but I'd like your comment on that. Absolutely, Justice Thomas. So I think mandamus is a critical recognition of the fact that, of course, Congress can limit the remedies available in particular circumstances, and that's the right way to understand the mandamus standard. But that's quite different from telling the courts that they're to engage in statutory construction, as Congress clearly did in Section 706 of the APA, but then say there's a point at which you can't actually give us your best answer because you're deferring. And I think it's important from a separation of powers to under, purpose to understand understand that it's not just remedies are different. There's an accountability difference, because I suppose Congress tomorrow could decide that we're going to go back to a world where the only review of executive branch action is mandamus. 
but then Congress would be fully responsible for that highly unpopular decision. But so that's the difference, I think, the fundamental difference from a separation of power standpoint between a limitation on remedies where Congress does it specifically and essentially telling the courts in the APA specifically you have the interpretive authority over statutes no less than constitutional issues but then overlaying a doctrine that says what we're doing is interpretation. And that's the critical thing about the interchange between footnote 9 and footnote 11. Footnote 9 tells you as clearly as you can what you're doing in a Chevron case is statutory interpretation. But then in footnote 11, it says at a certain point, you stop doing statutory interpretation, even though you think there's a better answer, and you defer to a different branch of government. And it's not the branch of government the framers gave the interpretive authority to. It's the branch of government that the framers gave the implementing authority. So I think from that standpoint, Chevron is a fundamental, egregiously wrong decision that just gets it wrong this, on the basis of separation is, uh, of powers. There is such a tension in this. Interpretive authority, everybody seems to concede, um, means discretion. It means there's multiple meanings that you can take from something, and someone has to choose among those meanings. Um, it seems like most people agree if the court, if the statute uses reasonable, that Congress is delegating the definition of reasonable to the agency. And the agency is deciding what is reasonable within some outer limit um, either set within the statute or, or within the law. But the point is that I don't I, — it's great rhetoric, Mr. Clement, but we do delegate. We have recognized delegations to agencies from the beginning of the founding of interpretation. And so I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss to understand where the argument comes from. Well, let me try to clarify. I think there is a difference between recognizing discretion and recognizing delegation. There are certain statutory terms, as you yourself point out, that, ha that, that properly construed by the courts definitively would give the agency a realm of discretion in which to operate. But there are other terms in which it is really a binary question. And the problem, the fundamental feeling of Chevron is it doesn't do a good job of distinguishing between the two and the the best example is Brand X. Broadband communications are either an information service or they are a telecommunication service. It might be hard to figure out which one, but they can't be one on a Tuesday and the next on a oh, Thursday. Oh, wait a it's minute. A that's, 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 that, it, it may be binary to you, but I do know that with the development of technology and with the development of how that is implemented in terms of transmission and the Internet, that over time that's going to change. But just to so to my and just the, and the same issue, even in the case that we're in right now, there were two areas that Congress looked at and knew that monitors were critical, okay? Foreign sea travel, for obvious reasons, because there's very little that outside, um, once those ships leave, that people, that the U.S. government can do to them. And the other was the, I think it was the North Pacific area, but the point is that that doesn't mean that similar problems didn't arise later and that the broad words giving the secretary the power to monitor and implement measures to ensure that its conservation goals were being followed wasn't given to the agency. Those are the facts that what we should be looking at, in my judgment, is, is, are, is this measure commensurate with what drove the similar measure, not identical, in the other two examples. And the agency should have first crack at that. So I disagree. If they're not similar. Are, are you going to let Paul Clement get a word in any time, Sonia Sotomayor, or just about a raw curiosity? Anytime you want to let him get a word in would be fine, by the way. Damn. The court will look at it and say, your decision was arbitrary and capricious. If they are similar, we might say, okay, this is all right. I don't know the answer to that because we really haven't dug into that, but it's just the point I'm making, so, which is that things change on the ground. So, and a definition you give today may not hold up to new facts. 
So facts do change on the ground. That is part of the problem with Chevron in Brand X. If there's a difficulty in classifying broadband today, the difficulty is that the statute was last passed in 1996. So figuring out whether 2023 broadband is a 1996 information service or a 1996 telecommunication service is a granddaddy of a problem. But it does have a binary answer. It's one or the other. Oh, what a great answer. What a great answer, right? It's like, yeah, the facts change, but the law doesn't. I like this so good. It's like so good. Yeah, so Congress wrote a law in 1996. There's like, there's information services and telecommunication services. So what is this thing in 2023 versus in, 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 in 1996 terms? Is it an information service or a telecommunication service? So that might be a problem, but it does have a binary answer. So the facts can change, but the law doesn't. So the change, the change is based on the factual change, not the legal interpretation. What a great answer. Great, man. Now, bringing it home to this statute, what I would say is if you do the Chevron ambiguity test, you find a word like appropriate in the statute, or maybe for some people carry, though I think that one's pretty clear, and you say that word is ambiguous. So I'm going to go to step two. That's what the court below did. <laughs> but if you look at the statute as a whole, and if you looked at it the way you would in any other context, I think what you would see is this is a classic case for exclusius inclusius. Forget the exact Latin phrase. But the point is you have a situation where in the most commercially well-heeled fishery in the country, Congress did two things. It said you may, not must, have monitors paid for by the industry, but you must, if you do that, cap the fees at 2 to 3% of the value of the catch. Now, a Congress that did that with the most well-heeled fishery in the nation, I do not think possibly conveyed the authority to the agency to say, with a much different uh, fishery in the Atlantic, where it's small business people, we're going to let you do a effectively the same thing, but we are going to let you do it to the tune of 20% of their annual returns. I think if you strip away Chevron, this is a fairly easy case where you just say, wow, Congress had this question in mind in one place, or actually three places to be specific, and with every domestic fishery, they only gave it in two instances, and in both instances, they said it can be no more than 2 or 3% of the you're value just, of the you're just You're just arguing that the statute's not ambiguous on that question. I am arguing that the best reading of the statute is that my client wins. Now, if I have to, well, I but it go seems through. To, it seems to me that you're not contemplating the possibility of another reason, a, 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 another result. And, and that may be right. What you're saying is that this is not a case where there can be a number of different interpretations. But I don't think that's coming to grips with the Chevron question. Well, I hope it is, Your Honor, because what I would say is exactly what I heard Justice Kavanaugh saying, which is I don't think there is a different rule of statutory construction in cases where agency is a party, when, in cases when agency is not a party. In Preach both it. cases, you just can't get to a certain point and say, gosh, this is hard. I think the law has run out. In both cases, you are supposed to take it all the way to coming up with your best answer. Now, if you... But I mean, that's just really good, right? This shouldn't depend on whether the agency is involved or not. That's just good, right? It can't, it can't, the rules of statutory construction should not depend on whether the agency is involved in this thing or not. That doesn't make sense. That's pretty good. You were just saying, I mean, that the principle of exclusio unius uh, answers uh, the question. Um, and if it answers the question, I guess I don't understand how you even get to the Chevron issue. Because Chevron step one, you would give the same answer. Maybe you would, Your Honor, but nobody knows where step two ends and step two begins. And, you know, for I, I mean, I suppose now taking the hints from Kaiser, which is about our, not Chevron, you would say, well, of course you apply all the standard canons of statutory construction before you get to step two. But, but the point is, in every other case, you apply all those canons, and if you're not sure about the answer, you dust off the back of Scalia and Garner and you see if there aren't some other well, canons. because you have no other option. I mean, what, what Chevron is, is it's a recognition that in certain cases you apply all those tools and the conclusion you come up with is Congress hasn't spoken to this issue. And if you had no other option, you're a court, there's a case before you, you try as hard as you can, even though you know you're basically on your own. But with, when Chevron comes in, when there is an agency, 
What Chevron says is now there are two possible decision makers. There's the agency and there's the court. And what we think is that Congress would have preferred the agency to resolve this question when congressional direction has cannot be found because of the agency's expertise, because of the agency's experience, because the agency understands how this question fits within the statutory scheme. So it's not a question of the court couldn't do it. It's a question of once congressional direction can't be found, who does Congress want to do it? So, Justice Kagan, I don't agree with you that the law runs out in those circumstances, even, st- even though there's an agency there. But I will give you this. If I did believe it, I would say, at that point, let's give the tie to the citizen. Let's not give the tie to the agency. And I think it's See, important. See, I don't think it's like what we would do. You would give the tie to the citizen, and I would give the tie to the agency. Chevron is about what Congress wants. And you can call it fictional or you how, how can Chevron be about what Congress wants? That doesn't even make sense. Because you yourself said earlier, like the whole premise is, the whole premise of your question is, she says what Chevron is, it's this recognition that in certain cases you apply all the tools of statutory construction. And the conclusion you come up with is that Congress hasn't spoken to it. So her premise is Chevron's what happens when you run out of tools. Chevron's what happens when you run out of statutory construction. And Congress hasn't spoken. And then she turns right around and says, Chevron's about what Congress wants. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. If you've used all your tools, if you've used all your tools of statutory construction and you can't figure out the answer, you've already implicitly determined that Congress hasn't told you what it wants. So how can Chevron be about what con- what Congress wants? That doesn't make sense. It's a, it's a flat contradiction. It's a flat contradiction. If using every tool you have in your tool bag, you say Congress hasn't, hasn't spoken to the issue, how can Chevron possibly be about what Congress wants? Because Congress hasn't spoken to the issue. Am I the only one seeing this? Am I the only one seeing this? Am I missing something? How's this not just a flat contradiction? I want, but we have lots of presumptions that operate with respect to statutory interpretation. And this is just one of them. It's just saying Congress understands as well as anybody different institutionals, comparative attributes, and comparative virtues. And it does not want courts making you can, I mean, it's law, but it's policy-laden judgments once, once Congress's direction can't be found. So, Justice Kagan, if we're going to talk about what Congress wants, we probably should at least avert to the fact that we do have an amicus brief in this case from the House and its institutional capacity. And it doesn't want Chevron. It's on our side of the case. If it it doesn't want Chevron, it has total control over Chevron. It can reverse Chevron tomorrow with respect to any particular statute and with respect to statutes generally. And it hasn't. For 40 years, it has acceded to Chevron, except in super rare cases. It has basically said, this is the background rule. It gives us a stable default rule from which to write statutes, and we've accepted that. So let me say three things about that. First of all, I'm not sure everybody in Congress wants to overrule Chevron. because well, everybody really, in Congress doesn't want to do everything. But, you know, my point is, it's really convenient for some members of Congress not to have to tackle the hard questions and to rely on their friends in the executive branch to get them everything they want. I also think Justice Kavanaugh's right that even if Congress did it, the president would veto it. And I think the third problem is, and, and fundamentally even more problematic, is if you get back to that fundamental premise of Chevron, that when there's silence or ambiguity. We know the agency wanted to delegate to the agency. That is just fictional, and it's fictional in a particular way, which is it assumes that ambiguity is always a delegation. But ambiguity is not always a delegation. It's actually slightly worse than ambiguity because you've reached a, po- you've reached a position of silence, essentially. If, reading, if, if using every possible tool in your tool bag, you can't figure out what it is, then you're basically silence. So silence is delegation. By Congress not passing laws, they give agencies power. That's a strange view, man. That's a strange view. Congress doesn't pass a law. 
because that's the entire premise, right? We can't figure out what Congress wants. We've used every tool. We can't figure it out. So the silence that's left means, oh, Congress wanted them to have the power. How does that make sense? And more often, what ambiguity is, I don't have enough votes in Congress to make it clear. So I'm going to leave it ambiguous. That's how we're going to get over the bicameralism and presentment hurdle. And then we'll give it to my friends in the agency, and they'll take it from here. And that ends up with the phenomenon where we have major problems in society that aren't being solved, because instead of actually doing the hard work of legislation, where you have to compromise with the other side at the risk of maybe drawing a primary challenger, you rely on an executive branch friend. Pre it, baby. What you want. It. And it's not hypothetical. When I hear you talk about... You said you end up in gridlock, which we have now. No, what I'm saying is Chevron is a big factor in contributing to gridlock. And let me give you a concrete example. I would think that the uniquely 21st century phenomenon of cryptocurrency would have been addressed by Congress. And I certainly would have thought that would have been true in the wake of the FTX debacle. But it hasn't happened. Why hasn't happened? Because there's an agency head out there that thinks that he already has the authority to address this uniquely 21st century problem with a couple of statutes passed in the 1930s. Yep. Yep. So why does Congress have to act? Why does Congress ever have to act? Because they just get the agencies to do whatever they want. So so Congress doesn't have to do anything. They just let the executive branch run everything. They don't have to do their job. Yep. And he's going to wave his wand and he's going to say the words investment contract are ambiguous. And that's going to suck all of this into my regulatory ambit, even though that same person, when he was a professor, said this is probably a job for the CFTC. Mr. That's Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask you to address stare decisis. Let's say, let's, let's assume for the sake of argument that I agree with you that in 706, Congress has spoken to the problem, that we're not applying a fictional presumption, but that Congress has told us, you know, we want courts to decide questions of law. The, the Solicitor General in the last argument talked about how litigants will be lining up for cases that were decided under step two to seek to reopen challenges to the agency's interpretation. What do you have to say about the disruptive consequences of overruling? So I think the Solicitor General, with all due respect, will be saying the exact opposite if this court overrules the decision and will be saying, no, you got to look at it at the right level of generality. What wow, that's that's some pretty that's a pretty bold position. That's a pretty bold position, but I'm here for it. Like, there's not a lot of people other than Paul Clement who can get away with this. So it's called Paul, Paul Clement has the reputation to back it off. He just said the Solicitor General is full of shit. They're telling you something, but if it actually happened, they'd be telling you the exact opposite thing. Wow. There's not a lot of people who can get out, get away with calling out the Solicitor General like that. Yeah, they might be saying that, but if it actually happens, they'll say literally the exact opposite. What a boss Paul Clement is. Woof. What I would say is this court has moved away dramatically from certain methods of interpretation, more dramatically than just we look at legislative history less now than we used to. Implied causes of action, as far as I can tell, are dead. But that didn't mean that every decision that was decided in the bad old days was overruled ipso facto. But that's a little bit different because those implied causes of action, the court was saying this is what the statute means. Like Title IX implies the cause of action or whatever. This would be different because the court would just be saying, may not be the best, but the agency's interpretation is reasonable. So it doesn't settle it in the same way that maybe some of those old implied cause of action cases did. If you don't want there to be disruption, all you have to do is make the precise level of generality move that you alluded to, which is, I would think, in every one of these Chevron cases, the question is, is the agency's interpretation of the statute lawful? And if the court has already held, yes, it is lawful, I would think that would settle the matter. And as I say in our brief, the only reason I have any doubt about that is because of Brand X. And Brand X is a huge embarrassment for the government and the government's friend. I looked through the bottom side amicus. I counted 13 amicus briefs on the bottom side. Only two of them cited Brand X. Because, gosh, it would be nice for that decision to just go away, wouldn't it? Sorry, wouldn't it? Justice Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> but that... Woof. Right? So this guy's like, yeah, just calling out, just calling out the Supreme Court hardcore. Right? Just calling out Justice Thomas, calling out the Solicitor General, laying it down, baby, laying it down. He he's he he's one of a very select few of people. He's one of a very select few few of people who can actually get away 
with actually telling a Supreme Court justice to their face they're just wrong. And the reason he's gotten there is through his hard work and his merit. He's earned it, man. He's earned it. So he can get up there and say, Solicitor General's telling you crap. Just Thomas, you're full of shit. <laughs> There's not a lot of people. And he says it with absolute confidence, no doubt in his mind. <sighs> He's just too good. He's just too good. <sighs> man, I don't know how you get this good. Absolutely makes clear that, you know, this is a reliance destroying doctrine. And frankly, if you said that Chevron is over and all of those step two cases that were decided are going to have stare decisis effect because of the level of generality point I made, you would be giving new stability to the law. It would be improving stability. And that's an important distinction from Kaiser. In Kaiser, you know, the Kaiser doctrine, the hour doctrine rather, never had its brand X moment where this court made clear that the agency could flip 180 degrees. And indeed, in Kaiser itself, it suggested the opposite. But here with Chevron, we know this is a, a reliance-destroying doctrine. Here's another thing to think about in terms of Kaiser. As I read the court's decision, in addition to the fact that we know it doesn't directly speak to Chevron, thanks to the Chief Justice, I also read it as all, all it says is you need a special justification. Well, I think we've offered you special justifications in droves, and special justification beyond the decision being wrong. And I, I don't know of a case where you would defer on stare decisis crisis grounds when the relevant decision didn't cite the relevant statute at all. I mean, look, this would be a different world if Chevron went in and wrestled with Section 706 and said, despite all contrary textual indications, that it forecloses de novo review of statutes. I suppose I'd have to be here making every single stare decisis argument. But that is not what Chevron did. It didn't even mention the relevant statute. Now, of course, I don't want to be seen as running away from the stare decisis factors, because I'm happy to walk through all of them, because I think all of them cut in our favor. The decision is tremendously unworkable. Nobody knows what ambiguity is. Even my learned friend on the other side says there's no formula for it, and that's an elaboration on what the government said the last time up here, which is that nobody knows what ambiguity means. But that's just workability. Let's talk about reliance. I talked about the Brand X problems, which are very serious problems. And, like, I love the Brand X case because broadband regulation provides a perfect example of the flip-flop that can happen, but it's not my only example. There are amicus briefs that talk about the National Labor Relations Board flip-flopping on everything. Ask the little sisters about stability and reliance interests as their fate changes from administration to administration. It is, a, it is a disaster. And then you get to the real-world effects on citizens that Justice Gorsuch alluded to, but I'd like to emphasize its effect on Congress because, honestly, I think when the court was originally doing Chevron, it was looking only at a comparison between Article 2 and Article 3 and who's better at resolving these hard questions. I think it got even that question wrong but it failed to think about the, the incentives it was giving the Article I branch. And that's what 40 years of experience has shown us. And 40 years of experience has shown us that it's virtually impossible to legislate on meaningful issues, major questions, if you will, because, it, right, because right now roughly half of the people in Congress at any given point are going to have their friends in the executive branch. So their choice on a controversial issue is compromise and forge a long-term solution at the cost of maybe getting a primary a challenger, or instead, just call up your buddy who used to be your co-staffer in the executive branch now, and have him give everything on your wish list based on a broad statutory term. And my friends asked for empirical evidence. I think you just have to look at this court's docket. It's been one major rule after another. It hasn't been one major statute after another. I would have thought Congress might have addressed student loan forgiveness if that were really such an oh. important issue to one party in the in, in, in Congress. I would have oh. thought maybe they would have fixed the, the eviction moratorium. I could go on and on on these issues. They don't get addressed because Chevron makes it so easy for them not to tackle the hard issues and forge a permanent solution. My friends on the other side also talk about, you know, this is, this is great because it leads to uniformity in the law. Well, I don't think that's an end in itself. Again, if it were up to me, if, we're, if we think uniformity is so great, let's have uniformity and let's have the thumb on the scale inside of the citizen. But the reality is the kind of uniformity that you get under Chevron is something only the government could love because every court in the country has to agree on the current administration's view of a debatable statute. You don't get the kind of uniformity that you actually want, which is a stable decision that says this is what the statute means. I, I mean, what can you even say? 
what what can you even say i mean dude i i didn't know you were gonna fuck this hard god damn it's it's shit it's so good it's so good man uh, thank you raven254 for the 10 gift memberships holy shit um I mean, he just destroys them. He just destroys them. He destroys them all. You guys want to talk about Starry Decisis? I got your Starry Decisis right here as he plops his balls right on the table. I didn't know we could do gratuitous sex at the Supreme Court, but holy shit, dude. I mean... He's so good. He's so good. <sighs> Mr. Command, can I ask you the same question I asked Mr. Martinez about why Chevron was initially popular? People who were very sophisticated and had a deep understanding of how judges decide what a statute means, and a deep understanding of how administrative agencies work, thought that Chevron would be an improvement because it would take judges out of the business of making what were essentially policy decisions. Now, were they wrong then? And if they weren't wrong, then what, if anything, has changed since then? So, Justice Alito, I think they were partially right then. So let me say what's changed and what hasn't changed, i.e., what the court missed back in Chevron. What has changed is we've come a long way in statutory interpretation. And, you know, if Chevron was a response to some of the excesses of the D.C. Circuit in the freewheeling days of the late 70s and the use of legislative history, and, oh, by the way, the text of this statute appears in the margin of my opinion, and I'm not going to talk about it again because I'm off to the races, we now, I think, are all textualists the focus is much greater yeah so like this is this is so good right so yeah the the conservatives in the reagan administration were the ones initially that proposed chevron right this was the, this was considered a republican win at the time the problem was the dc circuit was off its rocker right the dc circuit is the one that hears the vast majority and within a rounding error, all the administrative law cases, because they're, you know, in D.C. where the administrative court courts are, where the administration is. So they hear, you know, within a rounding error, all the admin cases. So the the D.C. circuit back in the 70s was like, well, you know, we're the ones that get to decide. So we'll just interpret it to mean whatever we want to mean, because, you know, we know best, you know, putting on their ivory tower robes of whatever, right? So Chevron was initially a Republican proposal because the court was so far out of control that it's like, well, we need a way to get past the D.C. circuit because, well, all the cases are going to D.C. We can't get it. We can't get a circuit split because all the cases are going to D.C. So we can't get a circuit split, particularly at the time, because the idea of filing administrative cases outside of D.C. is something that grew more. Right. So in the, particularly at the time, we can't get a circuit split. We can't get anything to the U.S. Supreme Court, and also they're against us all the way, by the way, too, because of course the Supreme Court at the time was on the left, right? So you had the you had the uh, the D.C. Circuit that was on the left. You have the uh, Supreme Court of the United States that's on the left, just basically doing whatever they want by judicial fiat, right? We don't need legislation, we don't need this, so we'll just do it ourselves. And so they're like, okay, well, let's give it to the admin agencies because the Reagan administration had that, and that way we can bypass the courts. So, yeah, but as – so as, he's like, well, why weren't people opposed to it at the time? Well, because the D.C. Circuit was – the D.C. Circuit at the time sucked balls <laughs> is his answer. The reason people weren't opposed to it at the time is because the D.C. Circuit su sucked balls, but now we're all textualists. Now we're all originalists, so it doesn't matter anymore. So because we're all committed to text, and so we've gotten a lot better about this in statutory interpretation land, because Scalia won the fight. Scalia basically single-handedly, personally brought originalism back from a dead-letter interpretation that law schools actively laughed at at the time. The history of Scalia on this was he basically single-handedly changed not only the Supreme Court, but all the courts. He basically single-handedly changed the entire legal establishment in the country. At the time, 
when Scalia was still like, I think he was Professor Scalia then, right? I might have been. I think he was Professor Scalia before he was associate before he was Judge Scalia before he was Justice Scalia. So like Justice Scalia or Judge Scalia, I think he was judge at the time, formed the Federalist Society. I think at Yale, which is sort of ironic. And then basically at the time originalism was laughed at. It was seen 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 by the law schools as an old and antiquated and forgotten doctrine, something best forgotten in the past. Justice Scalia basically single-handedly beat the entire legal establishment to death and got originalism not only taken seriously, but now the dominant legal theory of interpretation. So, like, yeah, that that definitely happens. So never say one guy can't make a difference. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, because Justice Scalia beat everyone to death, now we're all textualists and now we're all originalists. So we can go back to the court actually doing its job instead of being, you know, a super legislature. Yeah. Yeah. On the text of the statute. And once you recognize that, you recognize the problem with deferring at a certain point to the agencies. And let's look at the track record of the agencies before this court. If they are so expert, they should be able to persuade you in case after case that they're getting these statutes right. By my count and by the Cato Institute in their, inst in their amicus brief, since the court last cited Chevron, the administration is batting about 300 in the these cases. So expertise is not all what it's cracked up to be. And that's true even in the most complicated cases. Look at the American Hospital Association's case. I don't think you're going to find a statute that's more complicated than that one. But yet this court had no trouble unanimously saying that you can't have hospital chain specific pricing without first doing a survey. Well, I don't know whether you can say we had no trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say that. But, yeah. <laughs> No one was troubled to write a dissent. <laughs> Let me put it that way. But, and, and I can use other examples. Encino, a case where this court said that Chevron wasn't applicable because of a procedural defect. Now, it split the court five to four, but how did it decide the case? It decided the case with the distributive canon. Do you think the Labor Department Wage and Hour Division is the experts on the distributive canon, or do you think Booyah. the courts are? Booyah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Clement. Uh, the answer uh, from Mr. Martinez on several uh, questions about what happens when you, you know, get rid of Chevron in this case was uh, Skidmore. Uh, and if Skidmore yeah. is going to occupy a more prominent role. Uh, That's what I've been saying for years, baby. That's what I've been saying for years. Make Skidmore great again. Make Skidmore great a man. Woof. Woof, baby. Uh, going forward, I, I'd like to know exactly what your understanding of that principle is. So my understanding of Skidmore, consistent with Justice Kavanaugh's, is it's not actually a deference doctrine. Call it a doctrine of weight or persuasiveness. And then the beauty of, of Skidmore, as I understand it, I suppose the defect as well. Justice Scalia called it the totality of the circumstances. But I think the Skidmore test allows you to consider the weight of the agency's views, but then consider, is it something they came up with, like right after the statute was passed, so it actually sheds light on the original public meaning of the statute? Or is it something that they didn't adopt for 20 years later? Or did they adopt one policy right after the statute was passed and actually flip it over 20 years later. All of that is something that Skidmore can account for that Chevron has never been caused to account for. Now, you could modify it, to, you know, a la Kaiser and try to add all of that to it, but I do think that the Chevron exp experiment has failed. Well, it's usually described as a deference doctrine. People talk about Skidmore deference. Yes, they do, Mr. Chief Justice, and that puzzled me a little bit, and I went to the dictionary and I looked up deference, and the most common definition is yielding to the will of another. And I think if that's the definition of, de of deference, then you shouldn't apply Chevron, Skidmore rather, in a way where you actually say, all right, this is super close, and I think I have the right answer, but I'm going to yield to the position of the executive branch. That's never what Skidmore uh, has been understood to mean or said. It, it said it, the, the persuasiveness of the government's interpretation depends upon the circumstances. Neil Gorsuch just and feeding him the answer right now. 
absolutely. Call it what you will. That's what it is, right? Look, I don't mean to be pedantic, but I do think that calling it deference I, sort of I, gets I, you to footnote <laughs> 11 land in a junior varsity way, and I think that would be yeah. unfortunate. And the other great thing about Skidmore is it. Oh, oh, sorry. Skidmore. I mean, what does Skidmore mean? Skidmore means if we think you're right, we'll tell you you're right. So the idea that Skidmore is going to be a backup at once you get rid of Chevron, um, that Skidmore means anything other than nothing. Skidmore has always meant nothing. I, I, Justice Jackson, the earlier one, would beg to differ with you on that score. He Ooh, I, I was like a little burn. Justice Jackson, the earlier one. Nice. He thought it was quite important, and I think, you know, if you look at the Skidmore case itself, I mean, it took into account the wage and hour division's view of waiting time, and ironically enough, in that case said, you know, we can't have a bright line t test one way or another, because the agency has looked at this and thought a lot of time, and it's really going to be more fact-dependent than that, and we can take that into account. I think in some of these situations, you are going to be able to look at the agency's expertise and make a judgment that this is in their bailiwick. They've really made some pretty good points, but in other contexts, you're going to see that what the agency wants you to defer to is its own view that, as in this case, we ran out of money. And it sure would be nice if we could just impose this fine and Preach continue it, baby. to monitor these people at a 50% rate. This is good uh, stuff. Making them pay for it instead of us yeah. having to pay for it. I Thank mean, you. that's there's no Thank you. And, Mr. expertise Justice there. Thomas? Justice Alito? Mr. I guess what I'm struck by, Mr. Clement, um, and, and, and this follows from this Skidmore thing, because Skidmore is not a doctrine of humility, but Chevron is. Chevron is a doctrine that says, you know, we recognize that there are some places where congressional direction has run out, and we think Congress would have wanted the agency to do something rather than the courts. We accept that because that's the best reading of Congress, and also because we know in our heart of hearts that, con that agencies know things that courts do not. And that's the basis of Chevron. And then you take that doctrine of humility and you put on top of it, stare decisis, another doctrine of humility, which is to suggest we don't willy-nilly reverse things unless there's an, a special justification. Here, Kaiser said, it's even more than that. There's even more reason not to reverse something because there have been 70 Supreme Court decisions relying on Chevron, because there have been 17,000 lower court decisions relying on Chevron. And you're saying blow up one doctrine of humility, blow up another doctrine of humility, and then expect anybody to think that the courts are acting like courts. With respect, Your Honor, this Court has on multiple occasions corrected its own errors when it comes to statutory interpretation, how to deal with qualified immunity, implied causes of action. In the Encino motor, cases, motor case, there was a canon of construction that said exemptions to FLSA uh, provisions should be construed narrowly. This Court overruled that and said that should have no role to play in interpreting the FLSA. It didn't run through the stare decisis factors. So I think there is is, I don't know whether you call it humility or just clarity, but when the question is judicial methodology, I think it's very weird to ask Congress to fix your problems for you. I don't think you actually want to invite, in all candor, that particular fox into your hen house and tell you how to go about interpreting statutes or how to go about dealing with qualified but immunity. Kaiser, five justices, a majority of this court, made clear that sh the, uh, our deference was uh, subject to normal judicial normal principles of stare decisis, and to the extent that there was a ratchet up or a ratchet down, it ratcheted them up because it understood that that deference decision supported was the basis for tens, hundreds, thousands of other decisions. So I'm going to be at a disadvantage in debating what exactly Kaiser held. But the way I read Kaiser is it said that you need a special justification beyond the decision being wrong. I think we've given you that in spades. Kaiser did not, with all due respect, wrestle with Saucier against Katz. It didn't, rec it didn't wrestle with Gaudin in the opinion. So I think I can, I can reconcile all your law by saying, all right, when it's a procedural rule or a court-made rule of interpretation, maybe we look to some of the same factors but they 
don't apply with the same weight as they would if it were a substantive result. And that does make sense because at least under our view of the world, when you move on from a bad methodology, you don't overturn all those decisions, those substantive decisions. They still stay there. So Section 1982 still has an implied cause of action. Section 1981 still has a cause of action. I could go on and on. Those cases don't get overturned. Thank you, Mr. Clement. Justice Gorsuch? One lesson of humility is admit when you're wrong. Justice Scalia, who took Chevron, which nobody understood to include this two-step move as originally written, and turned it into what we now know. And late in life, he came to regret that decision. What do we make of that lesson about humility? No, I, look, I, I do think that, you know, reconsidering particularly a methodological error is part of judicial humility. And I do think if you look at Justice Scalia's Perez opinion, uh, the mortgage banker cases, one of the things he said there most clearly, but he said all along, was our decision in Chevron was completely heedless of Section 706 of the APA. And if you're looking for a special justification to overturn an opinion, I think whiffing on the underlying statute entirely has got to be at the top of the list. That's nice. That's nice. So, yeah, it's like, yeah, you just made a fundamental <laughs> fundamental mistake on the statute. You just made a huge mistake. It's like, yeah, that's pretty good, man. That's pretty good. How are you guys liking the audio level, by the way? I had to turn down the gain a little bit. Is it coming in too hot? Are you happy with it? Is it hitting the right numbers? Getting the gain right on this has been troubling, but because I listened back to the last stream I did, and I thought it came in a little hot on gain, so I turned it down a little bit. How are we liking it? Are we good? Is it too blowing out the ears? Great. Try to get the audio perfect. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you. I try. It's just like, I, so I listen back. Okay, great. Audio is decent. Can we do better than decent? The perfect? Okay, thanks. Very great. Let's see. Where were we? Thank you. Justice Kavanaugh? A couple questions. Um, first on Skidmore, uh, I just want to say how I've thought about it, and you can tell me where this is wrong, uh, that it uh, respects contemporaneous and consistent interpretations as evidence of the proper original meaning of the statute, because that's kind of common sense in statutory interpretation more generally, that if an interpretation was contemporaneous and consistent, it's more likely to be correct. So that's respect, but the word deference I wouldn't have, wouldn't have used there. I think you have that exactly right, and one of the virtues of looking at Skidmore that way is it is consistent with a principle that this Court articulated in the Christopher against Smith Klein Beckman case, which is sometimes the industry is the one with a consistent long term understanding of the statute that goes all the way back and sheds light on the original public meaning. And it seems to me Skidmore allows you to say if the industry says is taking a position that's consistent from the beginning and the agency flips twenty five years into the enterprise, Skidmore gives you the tools for saying, all right, agency, you're going to lose that case. Chevron does. Right. The big difference between Skidmore and Chevron, there are others, is when the agency changes position every four years, uh, that's going to still get Chevron deference, but Skidmore would, the respect to that interpretation would drop out because it's not been a consistent and contemporaneous, uh, consistent from the contemporaneous understanding of the statute. Absolutely. Flip-flopping is a huge Skidmore minus, and it's a matter of indifference, or actually if you look at some of the things that Justice Scalia said in the beginning when he was enthusiastic about the doctrine, the fact he viewed the fact that agencies could flip-flop under Chevron as being an affirmative virtue. And uh, Justice Kagan raises uh, an important point about judicial restraint or humility in terms of Chevron, and that that's an important concern for any judge. I think the flip side, why this is hard, the other concern for any judge is uh, abdication uh, to the executive branch running roughshod over limits established in the Constitution or, in this case, uh, by Congress. So I think we got to find the that's, – that's why it's hard, find the right balance between restraint uh, and uh, letting the executive get away uh, with too much. On that front, do you – 
there was questions earlier. Do judges really rely on Chevron? You want to speak to that? No, I'd love to speak to that because I think that's an important consideration. I mean, one of the premises of one of Justice Kagan's questions in the first argument was that, you know, you rarely get to Chevron step two, but there are statistics on this. There is a, you know, the most exhaustive survey of over a thousand cases by Barnett and Walker. We cited on page 33 of the blue brief. It found that courts were reaching 70, were reaching step two in 70 percent of the cases. 70% of the cases. The Cato Institute brief, you might think, well, things have gotten better because that was a longitudinal study over a number of years. You might think, well, things are getting a lot better because we've signaled that Chevron is on sort of life support. But the Cato ran the numbers for like 20, 2020 and 2021, and it's down to 60%. But it's still well over half the time your average judge in the Court of Appeals is getting to step two, uh, and Judge Kethledge, you know, he hasn't updated that speech, but as far as I know, <laughs> Judge Kethledge still hasn't gotten to step two once. And <laughs> that's, an amb- that's, nice. that's an unsettlement in the law. That's a disconnect in the law that it's very hard to get your fingers around. Like, at least if, you know, one circuit says the statute means X and another circuit says Y, everybody can see that. Cert can be granted. This court can resolve the case. But if courts are deciding some cases step one, some cases step two in ways that are radically different, I don't even know how you really unearth that. So I think that's another huge problem with this. One uh, last question. Uh, if Sean Chevron were overruled. I think your brief says we should go ahead and decide the issue, the statutory issue in this case. Can you speak very briefly to why? Very briefly, because I think it would give a great illustration of how to do plain old-fashioned statutory construction. It would also be a useful object lesson in how far very good judges get astray by applying Chevron. Because another problem with Chevron, I'll still try to be brief, it tends to focus on one or two terms and ask whether they're ambiguous, and you lose the context of the statute. I think if you have the context of this statute and the fact that the only other places they put these kind of fees on domestic fisheries, they put a, a, a serious cap, and then they did it only for the most well-heeled fisheries or in special circumstances, this is an easy case to in good old-fashioned statutory construction. Thank you. Justice Barrett? So we have a host of canons, clear statement rules, some of which are constitutionally inspired. And when I asked the Solicitor General in the last argument about whether Chevron should be thought of, thought of as part of that package, she said that Chevron kind of stood distinct, that Chevron was unique. Can you address that? I think she's right about that. I think it, it sits out there like an island, and that's part of the reason to overrule it. And I think all the other canons, <laughs> I think all the other canons yeah, that I can I think, think so of too. are fully consistent with de novo statutory uh, interpretation. I might be missing one, but the ones I think of is when you're doing de novo statutory construction, you take into account all of those canons. Chevron's the only one I know that says that at a certain point, you just stop the de novo stuff. And- My audio is incredible. Aw, oh, thank you. I really appreciate that because I, I, I've been messing with the settings as I do because I reposition the mic. So I've been repositioning the mic to try to like get a different look. And I kind of like the look that we have now. Get the little shore back plate is kind of cool. And the orange thing by the side, kind of cool. Have the mic more in shot, I think. And so I've been messing with the gain settings. And like I listened back to the last setting and it just sounded like too high like the audio levels were just too the gain was too high so i turned the down the gain down a little bit to see where it hit and trying to see where it hits on the volume and making sure that it doesn't sound distorted at all because obviously i want the mic to come through right i spent all this money on this great quality mic and really want it to pop through so thank you thank you i try hard i really want to make it great for you guys i always do and you sort of surrender, even under circumstances where if the agency weren't a litigant, mm. you would. Yeah, Tony says you're making me a logo version to swap it out. Yeah, I've, I've, also, I've also seen companies that do that, that swap it out. Uh, there's, a, there's a company that does it that will make like a, a back plate for uh, like $25 or something with a logo. I was thinking about it, but I don't know. I kind of like the sure back plate. But if you want to make me one to have in reserve, that's cool. But I may or may not use it. I haven't decided. But, you know, because I, I was thinking about it. Yeah, there, there's a company that does it. So, yeah, I don't know. But I've definitely seen that where some people put their name on it. But having the Shure logo on there is kind of cool. Like, I don't mind people knowing it's a Shure mic. You know, that's that's cool. So, I don't know. It's something to think about. Keep going. I, that, only Chevron does that. 
One last question. You said, um, you know, you pointed out that on our docket we've had multiple cases in which the major questions doctrine has come up. Do you think that overruling Chevron is going to solve that problem? Because in a lot of those cases, the agency has hung its hat on words like appropriate, um, you know, uh, on the kind of language which I think, and you can tell me if you disagree about this, I think you agree that when a statute uses a word that leaves room for discretion, like appropriate, feasible, reasonable, that that is a delegation of authority to the agency. So don't you think agencies will still continue to rely on words like that in ways that might not, you know, limit our emergency docket? I'm not so naive to say that overruling Chevron is going to solve all the problems with the emergency docket, but it is going to make it a lot better. Because, sure, there's some places where they use appropriate or they try to use modify, which was bold in light of AT&T, but whatever. They pick some of these words that are more capacious. But that broadband case is coming here. That's a case that shouldn't be uh, Chevronized. You know, some, someday somebody's going to litigate whether crypto is an investment contract. Just as Kagan's confident that, you know, the AI is going to get here because of a statute, I think it's more likely that Congress is going to say, well, there's some scientific officer in commerce. We'll let them fix the problem. But so, so my, my own view of this is it's not going to – it's not a cure-all, but it's going to move things very much in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. General Preliger. All right. This should be really interesting because General Prolegar has definitely been warming up to me in recent years. Uh, or recently. So General Prologar has definitely entered my esteem. So it'll be really interesting to see how General Prologar does against, against, uh, you know, Clement. Cause yeah. So overall, I mean, it's just a brilliant line of argument. I mean, there's no flaws, no, no fuss. It's a brilliant line of argument. He has everything good, everything solid. So yeah, we'll see if Prologar can keep up. But Prologar has definitely been doing pretty good recently. So it'll be interesting to see when she comes up against the big boy how she does. All right, let's see. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Throughout this litigation and at times this morning, petitioners have sought to characterize this case as presenting a fundamental question of the separation of powers and a test of Article 3. Will courts continue to say what the law is? But I think stepping back, I want to make sure that what doesn't get lost in the shuffle is that petitioners have made an important concession that I think illustrates that the issue here is actually far narrower and that their attacks on Chevron lack merit and are unnecessary. The concession is this. Petitioners acknowledge that Congress can expressly delegate to agencies the authority to define statutory terms and fill gaps. Imagine, for example, if the statute said in Chevron, stationary source as defined by the administrator. I take both petitioners to give that up and recognize that is a delegation and courts should respect that. The role of the court in that circumstance is to make sure that the agency has followed the proper procedures and stayed within whatever outer bounds Congress itself has set. And all of that complies with the Constitution, of course, because Congress has Article I authority to delegate gap-filling authority to agencies, and the executive has core Article II authority to fill in those gaps. That's a core exercise of the executive power. And then the Article III courts are just fulfilling their judicial role when they give effect to what Congress has done and its choice to rely on the agency in that regard. But I think what all of this shows is that the constitutional attacks on Chevron and the suggestion that it's egregiously wrong in that regard lack merit, because there is no constitutional distinction between that kind of express delegation and the delegations recognized in Chevron. If Congress can expressly vest an agency with authority to interpret the law through an express delegation, then it can do the same thing implicitly, especially in a world where Congress has to provide the agency with the express authority to carry the statute into operation with the force and effect of law. Now, we can debate, of course, whether Chevron drew the right line in identifying exactly when these delegations have occurred. I think the court got that 
that right for all of the reasons I've tried to explain this morning. But I, I think it's important to recognize that that debate doesn't have a constitutional dimension to it that falls out of the equation. Instead, it's just a question of whether the court drew the right line in identifying when a delegation has occurred. And if you recognize that, then I think what's left over are the practical concerns that have been raised about Chevron. And I don't want to diminish the force of the concerns that some members of the court have articulated. But I also think that those concerns are manageable. The court could do in this case what it did in Kaiser. It could clarify and articulate the limits of Chevron deference without taking the drastic step of upending decades of settled precedent. And I think that's the right thing to do here. You know, my, my friends in their briefs both said judges should aspire to be like umpires calling balls and strikes. But stare decisis is part of the rules of the game here, too. And in this case, I think all of the stare decisis factors counsel in favor of retaining Chevron. Not bad. Not bad. So... You know, it's 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 not bad. Um, so, of course, Congress can expressly delegate. I mean, no one denies that. If, of course, if the statute said in Chevron, sta stationary source is something defined by the administrator, that would be a delegation. Um, and Congress can delegate. That's pretty correct. And then the issue, and then, of course, they can do it implicitly if they can do it explicitly. But for me to do it implicitly, for me personally, I basically look for it to essentially be like no other possibility, right? They might not have said it explicitly, but there's basically no other interpretation. So if it's ambiguous, it's not implicit, right? Because at least, at least the patent lawyers, maybe we use the word implicitly a little bit differently, or maybe we use it in more of a strict technical sense. Because to a patent lawyer, implicit means there's only one way to understand this. Right? There, there's no other way to understand this. It might not say it, but there's only one possibility. It has to be this way. Um, but yeah, so, uh, but if there's ambiguity, it wouldn't be implicit. But so she says Chevron drew the right place and then says, if you still have concerns, maybe we can just fix Chevron. It's like, well, I don't know how you would necessarily go about fixing it without overruling it, but she at least gives a suggestion about what the court did in Kaiser with respect to Medicaid, Medicare interpretation, and maybe cleaning up the language and providing a new spin on it that would that would mol that would mitigate it. So, and and she she leans on stare decisis, which is not invalid. So she's off to a off to a reasonable start. I like it. She's off to a reasonable start. So let's 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 see what we got. I welcome the court's questions. How do you how do we discern uh, statute uh, delegation from statutory silence? So, Justice Thomas, I think that it would be wrong to suggest that you can neatly categorize cases as those involving silence and those involving ambiguity. And, and the reason for that, I recognize that, that Chevron itself used both of those terms, but I think that the court was just trying to be comprehensive about those kinds of circumstances where Congress hasn't itself directly resolved an issue. There's never going to be total silence in a statute. At the very least, the agency is going to have to be able to point to the express delegation of rulemaking authority, the direct from Congress to put the statute into effect with the force of law. So that will always be at least a baseline in this context. And then in the mine run case, you'll be able to point to any number of additional features of a statute that help to signal the agency's authority. And actually, this case is the perfect example because my friend said that the Madison Stevenson's Act here is silent on the issue of whether the industry can be required to pay for monitors. But we have four different provisions of the act that we've pointed to that undergird the agency's authority. There's the provision that expressly says that the agency can require the vessels to carry the monitors. Then there's the, de the definition of what a monitor is under the statute. It can include a private third party. Then there's the penalty provision that says in a circumstance where the vessel owner has contracted with a private third party and not paid, the agency can penalize. And finally, there's the residual authority to enact necessary and appropriate terms in these fishery management plans. So we don't think that this is a case about silence at all. General, yeah, that's really good. Again, we're back to the same question that chief head of, of Mr. Clement. That's a really good statutory interpretation argument. Sounds like exactly the bread and butter of what we do every <laughs> single day. And we can resolve that, right? We think that you could find that the statute is clear, but I think that... The fact that you think it's clear and Mr. Clement thinks it's clear 
But a court below thought it was ambiguous should tell us something, shouldn't it? No, I disagree with that. And I should say that I think actually if you look at both what the D.C. Circuit and the First Circuit were doing in these cases, they recognized the force of the arguments. The D.C. Circuit, it's true, and Loper Bright acknowledged that ultimately it couldn't conclude with confidence that the statute definitely authorized the agency explicitly. But you think it does? We think that there is a lot in the statute to, you, you yes, think, to support yes. the agency's Yes, you think you win under step one, and so does Mr. Clement. And yet here we are. I don't think it's at all unusual to find a case where the government thinks it has both the, the, the clear interpretation of the statute on its side and that the agency has acted reasonably. Yeah, because we have this amb ambiguous ambiguity trigger that nobody knows what it means. Well, just now, let me just ask you about the delegation, your, your, your example in, in the opening, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I totally understand a statute that does delegate. You know, you make up <coughs> what rate you think. And, and, and that might pose a delegation problem. Might not. Fine. But we know Congress delegated. That's one thing. What you're asking us to do is infer from a linguistic ambiguity that may not be the product of any intent at all. Pulsifer. And might mean or in some circumstances. And infer from that not that we should go to look at statutory context and other clues within the, the statute itself to determine who has the better reading, but the government should always win that case. No, not at all. Of course you should look at context. That seems to me That's very part different. Of the tools just to, of just, sorry, just to finish up, I, I understand the delegation in one context, but I struggle to see that we should infer the fiction of delegation in the second, always and necessarily. All so right, I, I disagree it. that there is a fiction of delegation in the circumstances that trigger Chevron. At the outset, I want to make perfectly clear that, of course, the statutory context and structure is one of the important tools of interpretation that a court should use at step one. So if we are in a world where the court can walk through those factors and ascertain that Congress spoke to the issue, let me just be very clear. We recognize the court then should give effect to what Congress is saying. And if what you're suggesting, then, is that in a world where Congress hasn't actually spoken spoken to the issue, the court should give no respect at all to the agency's interpretation. I disagree that that is faithfully implementing Congress's intent, because what Chevron recognized is in a circumstance where Congress hasn't spoken to the issue, given the express grant of, of adjudicatory or rulemaking authority to the agency, and necessarily recognize that the agency is going to have to fill the gap along the way, it is perfectly sensible to presume that Congress would want the agency to do it. Let me just ask you about Michigan versus EPA, too, because that, that had a very broad, it was somewhere between the example you gave of agency go forth and come up with rules and a linguistic ambiguity about the meaning of the word and. And it said essentially appropriate, necessary. Yet the court found there were outer boundaries even there that, that can be exceeded, right? Yes, absolutely. And we're not suggesting that in a so world where can, you're at can, can do that, right? But what I'm disputing is the idea that there is always a binary answer either way, rather than a vesting of discretion. There was a binary away. answer in Michigan versus EPA, right? There was a particular agency regulation that was under review, but if I understood my friend correctly today, he seems to suggest that in all statutory contexts, you can look and say, Congress dictated it. There is a binary answer with respect to broadband, or there's a binary answer with respect to how to define stationary source. And what Chevron recognized, and what I think is just absolutely true is a matter of the on-the-ground realities and how Congress legislates is that Congress doesn't actually decide all of these issues. What Chevron recognizes is that when Congress hasn't decided it and some follow-on person is going to have to fill in the gap and it's a question of whether it should be the courts or the agency, there is a presumption here that Congress intended it to be the agency, but always subject to those guardrails about making sure the agency's construction is reasonable. Mr. When Congress hasn't decided and some, some fallen person is going to have to fill in the gap, um, if Congress gives the gap, but that's sort of the thing. And like the problem is the Chevron deference is so wide that they basically all, they always find the gap. It's, it's very unusual for them not to find the gap. It's very, you know, the, the, the two part test is basically, is the statute ambiguous? And what did the agency decide? But the problem is ambiguity is almost a given. You you very rarely get to step two. Or yeah, like if, if no, basically the other way around. Like if it's if it's clear you stop, right? 
So you kind of always get to step two or the other way around. I forget which is which. It doesn't really matter. Either you're always or never doing it either way. And like and uh, Clement said, like he knew a judge who said in his entire career, he never got to the step because it's always ambiguous. It's so unusual to find statutes that aren't that aren't ambiguous or don't leave a gap of some kind. It's it's very hard because Congress can't think of everything. It's it's very difficult, especially when statutes are around for 30 years or 40 years or 50 years and reality changes. They can't think of everything. So. But. I mean, either Congress gave the power or not, and if they gave the power to decide, then fine. And there might be situations which it's clear that Congress gave the power, but Basically, Chevron assumes it. It's Chevron assumes that Congress gave the power, which seems like a very odd assumption. Because Congress, if they wanted to give the power, would say so. If they said nothing, it's it's assuming from silence that Congress wanted the agency to do it. It's like, well, this is a gap, and therefore the agency has to do it. Because it's it's the closest thing. Someone has to do it. Yeah. I'm not buying it, but it's an, it was an interesting argument. So I th it's worthy of a some further consideration. Mr. Clement, uh, uh, Mr. Clement suggested that we should ignore Chevron because it didn't deal with 706. Um, do you have a theory as to why it didn't address 706? Um, and um, and how do you respond to that part of his argument? Yes, so my theory for why Chevron didn't address 706 is because 706 has never been understood at any time, at the time it was enacted or in any of the eight decades since, to have dictated a de novo standard of review for all statutory interpretation questions. So there was no inherent tension between Section 706 and Chevron. I think it's actually just further confirmation of what the APA's own history shows. As I was trying to explain in the first argument, you know, this is a situation where the court has recognized that the APA wasn't meant to create dramatic changes. And it would have been a dramatic change going from all of the deference principles that have been deployed, particularly in cases of ambiguity in the case law, including immediately leading up to the APA, to a de novo standard on a prospective basis going forward would have been a big change in the relationship of how judicial review occurs for agency action. But no one mentioned that. No one suggested at the time that that was the right way to interpret the APA. It's never how this court has interpreted it. And I think this is an important point, Justice Barrett, in response to your questions about the APA. You know, it, it's not as though this has just been a one-off decision. The court has had any number of decisions, over 70 applying Chevron. And I think in each and every one of those, it's important to recognize that there hasn't been this kind of inherent tension between the APA and Chevron itself, which just, I think, further shows the court's own understanding of Section 706 is entitled to some weight here. So I have a question about the relationship between Brand X and your suggestion that we Kaiserize Chevron, essentially. So <laughs> I understand Brand X to say that a court must let go of its best interpretation of a statute if an agency advances an inferior but plausible one. Yeah, that's but basically you right. you told us that one way to handle this would be to emphasize footnote 9 and say what we said in the Kaiser context, context that no – you know, use all the tools in the toolkit and come up with your best interpretation. So why wouldn't adopting your approach require us to essentially repudiate Brand X? So if you understand Brand X to hold that the court can think it has a best interpretation, it has figured out what Congress was saying about this issue and Congress spoke and nevertheless has to adopt some inferior agency interpretation, then that is inconsistent with our approach. We, we don't read Brand X that way. I understand Brand X to be distinguishing between step one and step two holdings. So if there is a step one holding where, in fact, you know, the, the court has got it at the end of the day and recognizes that Congress spoke to the issue, there's no room under Brand X to let an agency come along after the fact and say, the statute should be understood some different way. It's only in the circumstance where there was Chevron deference granted under step two. And part of parcel of that is recognizing that that's because the statute was interpreted at the first time to not actually supply an answer dictated by Congress and instead to give the agency direction. But I'm sorry, discretion. Could have a best answer if it's a step two question? I mean, it seems to me that 
having a best answer suggests that you engaged in a question of statutory interpretation, came up with your best answer, and it might just be really hard. So sometimes if a court outside of the agency context confronts a difficult question of statutory interpretation, it might say, look, I'm 90 percent confident or I'm 95 percent confident. But, I mean, I, I think your reading of Brand X might depend on what the trigger for ambiguity is, right? Well, I, th- I do think that it's kind of clearly demarcating the lines between step one and step two holdings. And so at least the, the rules of the road are clear with respect to when an agency might have been granted discretion to revisit its prior conclusions. You know, if you're suggesting that there's a way to read Brand X to say that even in a circumstance factoring into the equation the possibility that Congress meant to delegate to the agency that there is a better interpretation, a best interpretation, that Congress actually resolved it. I just don't think you would ever get into the brand X scenario because that sounds to me like a step one ruling. That's definitely not what's happening in the real world. Yeah, that's definitely not what's happening in the real world. The... This is the better reading of the case. Amy Conant Barrett had the better reading of the case. She says, I understand Brand X to say a court must let go of its best interpretation of the statute if an agency advances an inferior but plausible one. That's, that's, that's the better reading. And she says, well, that's inconsistent with our approach, which means Brand X has to be overturned, which I don't, li- I li- I don't like that either, so that's fine by me. She says she understands Brand Wex to be distinguishing between step one and step two. No, that's not how I read it. I I read it more in line with Amy Coney Barrett. So, yeah. Yeah, that's what Brand X is in practice. Yeah. So maybe that's what they meant. But in the real world, that's that's not what it is. So. So Brand X might disappear, which is fine by me. Let's get rid of them all. Yeah. Could the court have a best answer if it's step two? I mean, it seems to me that having a best answer suggests you engage in a question of statutory interpretation. If you came up with your best answer, it might be really hard. So if a court outside the agency context confronts a difficult question, it might say, look, I'm 90% confidence or 95% confidence, but I think your reading of Brand X might depend on what the trigger for ambiguity is. Yeah. And she tries to respond by saying, you were suggesting there's a way to read Brand X to say even in circumstance favoring into the equation that Congress meant to delegate to the agency, there's a better interpretation, best interpretation, I don't think you'd ever get into the Brand X scenario. That is definitely not what's happening in the real world. And I take the point that there is some inherent, uh, you know, lack of precision in a term like ambiguity. That's not something that's uniquely created by Chevron, of course. There are ambiguity triggers in the laws in, in all kinds of contexts. But it's also that kind of indeterminacy that might be worrying you is not anything that's cured by overruling Chevron. Because as I was saying to Justice Kagan in the first argument, I think it will just open up a world where there is a lot of indeterminacy and inconsistency in how judges are applying the principles in a case of ambiguity. On that- on that point, um, some of the amicus briefs and the briefs point out the experience of some of the states with Chevron. Some states don't have Chevron, and other states have had something like Chevron but have um, eliminated it in recent years and decades. And their experience, they say, has shown that it's plenty workable in such a regime. So I just want to m- make sure you can respond to that. Yes. So my understanding is about half the states still have something akin to a principle of deference. There might be some variance with respect to how much it looks like Chevron, but I acknowledge that some states have abolished any form of deference to administrative agencies. I do think that there is a lot less concern at the state level about the lack of uniformity or consistency. So one of the values that Chevron implements and recognizes for why Congress would prefer for an agency to be able to set these rules and for the courts to respect that is the value in ensuring that there are uniform rules throughout the country. And I don't think that that same experience exists at the state level. And I would just add as well, in a lot of states, I think the political accountability rationales could differ as well because many state court judges are elected. Did did I understand you in response to a question from Justice Thomas to say that Chevron doesn't apply to constitutional questions? Yes, it's only a a doctrine that applies in the context of statutory interpretation. Well, I know, but how you interpret statutes certainly can have an effect in raising particular uh, First Amendment questions or otherwise. And does it apply in that situation? Department of Education has some rule. This applies to, you know, all 
all schools, you know, uh, and it does, it can apply to religious schools because this is how we interpret, you know, whatever the impact of the rule is. And when we interpret it that way, we don't think it raises any uh, free exercise problems. So is there Chevron deference there? So I think that if the, a particular interpretation would create serious constitutional problems, then the doctrine of constitutional avoidance is one of the traditional tools that the court can consult in order to understand whether Congress spoke to the issue. And yeah, and the agency says we don't think this causes particular uh, constitutional problems. That's our expertise about how we apply this provision, and given that, we think there's no free exercise problem. No, a court would not defer to that because this is all happening at step one. I think that this is part of the process of the court determining whether Congress spoke to the issue, and the court has been very clear that deference doesn't come in at all until you get to step two. So, for example, the agency's view that it deserves Chevron deference um, or, you know, it's kind of take on one of those step one issues, it's not itself uh, meritorious of getting any deference at that stage of the case. I do want to take another shot at trying to explain why I believe petitioners are wrong to have characterized Chevron as resting on a fiction. And I think what they have tried to say is that this doesn't really reflect what Congress is intending. But I see three principal problems with that. The first is that I think that actually looking at it from a, a matter of first principles, there is a lot of merit and weight to the recognition that in a situation of genuine ambiguity, there are good reasons for Congress to want to vest the expert agency with this kind of authority. It's the recognition that agencies of necessity are going to have to fill in the gaps, and many of these programs are complex, they're technical, they're going to require the agency to draw on its longstanding experience with the program and the expertise it's accumulated in working within that regulated industry in order to make a sensible regulation that also will encompass, I think, inherently some policy considerations. Congress would know that the agency can run a centralized decision-making process in doing this. Chevron only applies in circumstances where there is a sufficient level of formality in the agency's decision-making. That's usually notice and comment rulemaking, and that's a process where all comers can come in and tell the agency, here are our views, here's what you should think about in terms of regulating. Well, that, that, that notice point is a, a very important, it seems to me, to your argument, um, because the, the rationality of a supposition that Congress would want to favor the government rather than a supposition equally rational that it would want to favor individual liberty <coughs> is made a little more weighty if you assume that the government's provided everybody a notice, an opportunity to be heard. But often the government seeks deference for adjudications between individual parties and then apply that to everybody without notice to them. Or Australia. deference for interpretive rules for which no notice and comment, let alone formal, Rulemaking Breach it, Gorsuch. For Breach it. Proceedings is required, and so there are many circumstances in which the government does seek deference for a view of the law that affected parties had no chance to be heard about. What do we do with that? So I think with respect to the category of interpretive rules, uh, it's, it's true that the court hasn't ruled out that those can receive deference in appropriate circumstances. But in, so you'd have us kaiserize that? Well, I, I would just have the court reiterate what it said in Mead, which is it's not as though any agency pronouncement is necessarily going well, to Well, nobody knows deference. what Mead means. I mean, it's got seven factors to it, and the lower courts complain about that, too. So I'm not, I, I, I don't know what that, I mean, you know, is that another factor we're going to add to Mead? I I think that Mead is an important check on ensuring not only that there's been a delegation here, but that the agency has used the appropriate process and procedures. Okay, so, so interpretive rules would be out under your new... So I think they raise a much harder question. And a this harder question, but said are, are they ruled in or out on your theory? I think the court has not ruled them out under Mead. Uh, if you thought what would you have us a, do? I would have you retain Mead, which recognizes... What would you have us do with interpretive rules is my question, not Mead. I mean, I don't know what to do with Mead. Well, well, I don't think that you can treat them as a class. I think it's going to depend on some, the nature of the particular interpretive some, rule. And sometimes oftentimes, notice is required and sometimes it isn't. How about, how about adjudications? You keep those in, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We certainly think that Chevron has core application to adjudications, and I agree that in that circumstance there's not the same ability to take the uh, input from all comers, but the court has emphasized that in the mine run case where it has been applying Chevron deference, there is this possibility at least of a centralized decision-making process in order to ensure that the agency at least is gathering the facts and has the tools at its disposal. And the alternative to each of these, Justice Gorsuch, is to have the courts do 
do it through piecemeal litigation. At the very least, I think that it's easy to see why Congress might think that that is not as good of an alternative in a circumstance where the court's pronouncements could come out of nowhere with respect to a particular party. Now, we have an amicus brief from the small business. Except for everybody gets to litigate their case. Everybody. But, but I think that it's Until important to recognize that particular decisions can have impacts on parties who As are outside. As a matter outside. of precedent, possibly within that jurisdiction, but even that person who's bound by the precedent can appeal it all the way to the Supreme Court. Everybody gets their day in court. Absolutely. Versus, under, under your view, many people without notice, any notice or any chance to be heard, are bound. I mean, he's got a point, right? He's got a point like a lot of these things are happening with no notice, no opportunity, binding people has never heard of it, all the rest of it, you know? Yeah. No, so my concern and what I was focusing on with respect to the prospect of disrupting expectations with respect to litigation is that it's not as though every party who might stand to be affected by a case is necessarily going to know about it. Look at the amicus brief that was filed by the Small Business Association. No, of course they they're not going to have notice it. about somebody else's case, but when the government comes for them, they get to take their case to court. They get a new Obviously, judge. when they are a party, they, get to they have appeal. an opportunity they get to, to appeal. Okay. But Congress has often expressed a preference for not having these kinds of issues resolved piece by piece in different courts around the country with the prospect of the disuniformity that yes, that would create. Yes, it is provided for uh, notice and it provided for formal and informal formal rulemaking and adjudications. And it anticipated most of rules would be resolved that way. In fact, they aren't. For a long time, they, those processes haven't been used. And and agencies rely on informal adjudications and informal rulemakings. And really now today, perhaps as a product of Chevron and two, agencies have, have abdicated that and are moving more and more toward uh, interpretive rules where they don't have to provide notice. Yeah, this is this is really good. Neil Gorsuch is just holding her to a fire. It's it's really holding her to a fire. So like the APA, she says Congress has expressed a preference for having these issues resolved piece by piece. By giving it to the agencies, but it says they provide for notice in formal rulemaking. Anticipated rules would be resolved that way, but they didn't. They've been adopting these informal things and just agency guidance things without notice, without comment, that are driving all this stuff. You know, so there's no opportunity for anyone to be heard. Informal adjudication, informal rulemaking, no, no formality, just interpretive notes. No notice, and they bind you. Yep, preach it. Preach it. Comment. But I think that does circle us back to the fact that the court has not suggested that interpretive rules are necessarily going to trigger deference. And so I think at least in the mine run case that this court has looked at, it's the product of a formal okay, process from you. the agency. And I think it's an important process. Uh, on the adjudications front, I think one of the amicus briefs talked specifically about the NLRB in particular and kind of how that agency moves from toward a post uh, fairly often and the concern raised there because that is a situation you you can't adjust your behavior ahead of time necessarily based on a new rule new change interpretation what is done in the particular case and affects the people who didn't have notice. You know, any response to that brief or that scenario or want to tell me why that's wrong? Well, I guess my overarching response to that set of concerns is that the agency has to justify its decision making with respect to whatever uh, tool it's using to implement the statute in the way that Congress directed. So if Congress is telling the agency you should adjudicate or you should conduct notice and comment rulemaking or giving it its authority to choose between those tools, the agency in either context is going to have to justify what it's doing. And in particular, my Friends have focused a lot on the idea of agencies changing their minds. You know, there are burdens in this context. The agency has to take account of reliance interests. A lot of this gets put into State Farm, of course, but I think also at Chevron Step 2, with respect to reasonableness, a court can permissibly take those kinds of considerations into account. Thank you. Did you want to finish your answer about what you would say to uh, your friend's view of 
fictionalized intent? Yes. So I was trying to defend Chevron as a matter of first principles, and that was kind of the first order answer on this. That there are often really good reasons why Congress would want an expert agency to take the first crack at filling in the law. And there's no way around it. If the agency is administering the statute, the agency has got to do it. And this court has said that a core feature of executing the law is interpreting statutes along the way, understanding for the agency what the law means. The second point I wanted to make is that even in the situation where you think there's more room for doubt about exactly what was happening in 1984 and what Congress would have expected, this is a really foundational precedent from the court. It's not like Chevron has flown under the radar and Congress is unaware of it and doesn't realize it's out there and kind of setting the ground rules for how this court and lower courts are going to understand what Congress is doing. This is one of the most frequently cited decisions from the court. And in that context in particular, I would think that the inference of legislative intent becomes all the more sound because Congress has not chosen to displace it. And as well, it triggers, I think, that critical, strong form of stare decisis that the court applied in Kaiser when it recognized that in a situation where Congress is actually the best institutional actor to do something about it, it matters. It matters that Congress hasn't sought to change Chevron in any kind of fundamental way. Thank you, counsel. Anything I do have one more. I'm Hold sorry. On. I, I, I do. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, waiting. sorry. I was waiting for us to go around. Um, I know this is not in the heady um, intellectual question, but how do you respond to Mr. Clement's point about the interpretation of this particular statute and his reliance on the theory that this Congress definitely, when it capped a big industry paying 2 or 3 percent, whatever the number is, would not have wanted um, small fishermen to pay 20 percent? So I have a range of reactions to that. Um, my first is, as I was suggesting to Justice Gorsuch, we think, and to Justice Thomas, we think that there is a lot in this statute to support the agency's exercise of regulatory authority here. And I want to point in particular to the penalty provision, which specifically contemplates that the the regulated vessels might have a contractual relationship with third-party monitors and therefore might be in a situation where they haven't paid. And it says the secretary can sanction in that circumstance. So it's premised on the idea that there will be certain circumstances when there is that direct relationship. Just as a footnote in the schedule, in the way that Congress did the other two monitors, they were always government monitors, not independent monitors, correct? Yes. So in the this, so there are three fee-based programs that my, my friends have relied on to try to support this idea that there's a negative inference you should draw from the statute. Two of those apply in the domestic context, and those operate as pure fee-based programs, so it's very different. <laughs> Ultimately, they pay fees to the government. The government provides a range of services, including providing the monitors, entering into the contractual relationship, and having those monitors be government contractors. And those programs also pay for uh, particular administrative expenses that would not be a part of this program. The, the foreign vessel program likewise operates in this fee-based way. There is a residual part of that program which contemplates that in a circumstance where there aren't sufficient funds, it might be possible that the regulated vessel will then, through a supplementary authority, be required to contract with the monitors directly. And I think my friends would say, well, that's the whole explanation for the penalty provision. But it doesn't work because Congress put that penalty provision in an overarching section of the Act that applies to domestic vessels, too. If this was really just meant to be a tendril to tack on to the foreign vessel program, program, that would be completely inexplicable. So I think that they don't have a persuasive response to the penalty provisions here. And they say, to, to wrap this up, that, you know, the, it's, it's unheard of to charge 20 percent. I do want to be really clear. They are latching on to a part of the rule that acknowledged that earlier versions or studies had suggested that costs could go potentially up to 20 percent. But then the agency acted in response to that. It created waivers. It created exemptions. And with respect to some of the types of fishing at issue in these cases, the estimate costs were more in the range of 2 to 3 percent. So it's, this is all, you know, something that courts can look at and review. They, in fact, pressed arguments that this rule was arbitrary and capricious for neglecting to give full attention to the costs. The lower courts rejected those arguments, and I think rightly so. Justice Kagan? Um, Justice Barrett asked before about Kaiserizing Chevron, and I just wanted to ask, what would that mean? I mean, would it mean doing exactly what Kaiser did to our deference, to Chevron deference, would there be adjustments that would be necessary? Would one want to go further in any respect? What, what does it mean to Kaiserize Chevron? 
So I think that the court in this case, if it has some concerns about the implementation issues, could do four critical things, which draw heavily on Kaiser, but I think look a little different in their particulars. The first thing the court could do would be to reemphasize the rigor of the step one analysis. Now, this is drawn directly from Kaiser. As I mentioned before, we've seen results in the lower courts where they are now following this court's direction with respect to that. So in this regard, what the court would be saying is, don't wave the ambiguity flag too readily. Don't give up just because the statute is dense or hard to parse. Instead, there are a lot of hard questions out there that can be solved and reveal Congress's intent if the court applies all of the tools and really exhausts them. So that would take care of a whole category of cases. Then at step two, I think the court could again do what it did in Kaiser, which was to reinforce that reasonableness is not just anything goes. And Justice Gorsuch, I think at times has said it just means the government wins, but that is not actually the standard. Even even at that step two stage, it's obviously deferential, but the court should be enforcing any outer bounds in the statute and making sure that the agency hasn't transgressed those. I think the third thing the court could do is emphasize that this whole enterprise only gets off the ground in a me-type situation where you have the agency being directly empowered by Congress to speak with the force of law and then exercising appropriately a formal level of authority in implementing the statute. And so I think that that is an important principle as well, that there are certain contexts in which the agency is not actually speaking with the force of law or in a way that would be fitting with the delegation Congress has provided. And then finally, the fourth thing that the court could do, and I think this is a little bit different from Kaiser, would be to emphasize that it's always important to look at any other statutory indication that Chevron deference was not meant to apply. Um, and what I'm thinking here of are, are things like situations where the nature of the statutory question, as the court has said in other cases, isn't one where you would expect Congress Congress to give that to the agency. There's a flavor of this in the major questions doctrine case, and I don't want to rule out other scenarios that could come up, because part of our, our central argument here is Congress can adjust, Congress can react, Congress can take statute-specific steps, and so courts should pay attention to that, and there is nothing in Chevron that dictates that this presumption is irrevocable. Instead, it's fully rebuttable. And is there anything you would say about the matter of changed interpretations? So I think that changed interpretations already are an area where the agency is under additional burdens to justify its decision making. I think they get a harder look. And the court has made clear um, that in a circumstance where an agency is changing its regulatory approach, one of the things it has to do is take full account of the reliance interests and explain why those shouldn't alter what it's doing in, in, in the kind of revised approach. The agency also frequently, if it's come from a notice and comment rulemaking, has to run that process all over again. That's a, a time-intensive process. It takes a substantial investment of agency resources. So I think in that context, too, the court could police the bounds of that and make sure that the agency is following the procedural requirements to ensure that it's informed decision-making. But at the end of the day, if the agency can run the gauntlet and survive those hurdles, then the fact that it has some discretion under the statute to change its approach, I think, is not something to say is, is uh, you know, kind of a bug in the statute. Instead, it's a feature, because there are all kinds of circumstances where Congress would want to give the agency the ability to adapt to changing circumstances, to new factual information, or to the experience it's accumulated under the prior program. Thank you. Justice Gorsuch? Justice Kavanaugh? Justice Barrett? Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal, Mr. Clement? So on the whole, I think she did a pretty good job. I mean, obviously, she, she kind of knows that there's a lot of people on the court who want to do away with Chevron, so she knows she has a problem. But she tried to do things, but I think the biggest problem for her, at least in my view, is the mischaracterization of the case law, or at least the mischaracterization of how it's been handled in reality, because it's just not a fair characterization of how these cases are, right? So the cases stand for the proposition that the court, that the agencies get to interpret statutes, they get to interpret regulations, that they get to change their mind. And, the you know, is... If it's flatly contradicted by this text, then, you know, fine, but finding ambiguity is usually pretty easy because, you know, there's usually some ambiguity somewhere. It was like where, that's where, like, the CDC was trying to cram the rent moratorium into, like, and other stuff, right? So they were defying, like, every statutory interpretation. So it's, it's like, you know, we can do other things. This was, like, another thing, right? But, you know, that kind of thing is rare, relatively speaking. So the agencies get kind of away with it and they change their mind and all the rest of it. So she tries to find a moderated ground. She tries to speak to 
Kaiserizing Chevron to try to m- make it work. But I hope, I very much hope the Supreme Court is not going to accept the invitation. I'm very much hoping they'll just call for the end of Chevron. If they want to throw a Brand X an hour under the bus while they're at it, that's fine by me too. You know, that's fine by me too. Um, and just be like, yeah, no, that's not, that's not cool. And we're just back to Skidmore, which stands, as far as I can tell, stands for the proposition. They call it Skidmore deference. But I think, uh, yeah, what was it? Uh, it was actually Paul Clement who said, I think that's a bad name for it. And he's right. I mean, I never really thought about it, but it is a bad name for it. Skidmore isn't about deference. Skidmore is basically saying, you know, well, the agencies are experts and they certainly have a lot of things to offer in sort of the interpretation. But sort of, and so maybe their voice is maybe first among equals in some sense when it comes to what the interpretation of the law should be, but not more that, but not more than that, right? So, you know, they're, they're, so it's a totality of the circumstances because it's a totality of the law. So it's just basically, it's no more persuasive than it is at the end of the day, which is just kind of like law period. It's no more persuasive than it is. And maybe there's maybe there's a little bit of extra reverence for the administrative agency, but it's not in any sense dispositive. And so, yeah. So let's just go back to Skinmore. It's fine. So let's see how he how Paul Clement wraps this up in rebuttal. I'm sure it'll be great. On civil law, what happens when there's activist extremists? Well, we've already been there. Uh, we've already been there. That's sort of why Chevron came around in the first place, because the D.C. Court of Appeals was being extremist af- a- advocates, a- 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 you know, extremist, and trying to, like, do this by, yeah, so it's trying to do this by court power. So, like, how do you check power is, is always a legitimate question. Uh, Congress can write better statutes. That would help a lot, you know, so we'll see, but, yeah. I mean, you can't you can't give it to the admin agencies. It's just too much of a conflict of interest. You can't give them the power to to interpret the statute, and you certainly can't give them the power to write the regulation, interpret it, and execute it. And you certainly can't give them the power to do it without notice and comment in terms of, you know, these um, interpretive regulations or interpretive rules that are not published or not subject to comment. The whole thing is just way too squishy. So how do you deal with an out of control court? I don't really know, but. I know how we deal with out of control agencies and it's not working. So, and it is the province of the judicial branch to say what the law is. So I don't know how you deal with an out of control court. I don't really know. Elect better people, I guess, to not have out of control courts. I don't know. I don't know that. Yeah. There's, there's someone's going to have to decide at the end of the day, someone's going to have to decide. And so whoever that person is can obviously abuse their power. So how do you deal with that? I don't fundamentally know, but yeah. Can Brand X an hour stand without Chevron? Uh, uh, probably literally, yes, but their their logical underpinning is broken. But unless the Supreme Court says they're overruled, they still stand notwithstanding their logical underpinning. So Brand X might not be able to survive, but hour probably can, even though that doesn't make any sense. I just sort of had them rule all three, uh, rule all three and make my life easier. Just a few points in rebuttal, Your Honor. First, my friend started with express delegations. I think express delegations show all the problems with this fictional implied delegation. Because the great thing about an express delegation is you have some text. What an express delegation generally does textually is delegate implementing or executing authority. It doesn't do what Chevron purports to do, which is to delegate interpretive authority. But better yet, once you have text, you can put limits on the text. And Michigan against EPA is a perfect example of that. And of course, all of these delegations do raise Article I non-delegation concerns. And if you have text, you can check for that as well. But I can't think of anything that's more antithetical to an intelligible principle than ambiguity and silence. And I will say, in terms of the, the, the you know this premise, I think it's entirely fictional. I think in most cases, a statute is ambiguous because the proponent did not have enough votes to make it any clearer. My friend at one point said that I view the whole world as every statute has a binary answer. To be clear, my position was the 
opposite. There are statutes like that, reasonableness, appropriateness. There are also things like information services, telecommunication services, a service advisor. Is it a salesperson who is involved in the servicing of cars? I say yes, but you could say no, but it's binary. The terrible thing about Chevron is it can't tell the two apart because at a certain point they both look ambiguous. But if you, you know what can tell the two apart? Good old-fashioned statutory construction. Find yeah. out as the courts what the words mean. Reasonable is a term of capaciousness and elasticity. Telecommunication service is not. Good old-fashioned yeah. statutory interpretation can do the job. I mean, it's simple. It's basic. It's clear. I mean, what what can't you like, right? You know, okay, express delegation, show you all the problem with the fictional implied delegation. Yeah, it doesn't do what Chevron does, which is delegate interpretive authority. Once you have the text, you can put limits on it. Yeah, I can't think anything more antithetical to intelligent principle than ambiguity and silence. I think in most cases, statute's ambiguous because the proponent didn't have enough voices to make it votes any clearer. My friend at one point said, I view the whole world as every statute has a binary answer to my, be clear, my position is the opposite. There are statutes like that, reasonable appropriateness. There's also very, things like information service, telecommunication, the service advisor. Is a sale person who's involved in selling a cards? I'd say yes, but you could say no, it's binary. It's one or the other. The trouble thing is about Chevron, you can't tell the two apart because at a certain point, they both look ambiguous. But you know what could tell the two apart? Good old fashioned statutory construction. What a badass. What an absolute badass. Paul Clement is an absolute goat. He's an absolute goat. In my dreams, in my fantasies, where I argue where I argue in my mind about arguing to the Supreme Court, in my in my dream fantasies where I get to construct every question and give every answer, I am not this good. Paul Clement is amazing. He's amazing. Now, let me say the qu uh, one thing about the mystery of why Section 706 did not appear in the Chevron decision. There's a really easy answer. It was a Clean Air Act case. The court sort of stumbled into these pronouncements about how, as a meta matter, you should go about statutory consideration. It was a mistake. It didn't wrestle with the relevant statute at all. That is a special justification to revisit the decision and to get the decision right. Let me say one word about expertise. Expertise and deference do not have to go hand in hand in a way that precludes de novo review. We have things called tax courts. We have things called bankruptcy courts. We have the Court of International Trade. They all deal with technical specialized issues. Every one of them, the legal questions are reviewed de novo. I mean, dude. Dude, right? So, like, the special justification for expertise doesn't matter. We have specialized courts. We have specialized courts. Their, their determinations are still reviewed de novo on law. Specialization has nothing to do with it. What a boss. That's the basic understanding with a statute like seven, seven, Section 706. Lastly, let me say this. You cannot Kaiserize the Chevron doctrine without overruling Brand X. The fact that you could take into account if the agency had flip-flopped was part of the rationale of Kaiser money factors before you applied it. Hour. That is a feature, my friend correctly admits, that is a feature of the Chevron doctrine, and you really can't Kaiserize it without overruling Brand X. And if you're overruling Brand X, well, then Star Decisis just went out the window, and we might as well get this right. Booyah. Booyah, right? You can't fix Brand X. So as long as we're going to overrule Brand X, we might as well get it right. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I am not this good. In my fantasies, I'm not this good. <sighs> Unbelievable. Chevron imposed a two-step rubric that was fundamentally flawed. The right answer here is a one-step rubric that simply asks, how is the statute best read? Thank you. Thank you, Counsel General. The, the right answer is a one-step rubric that simply asks how the statute is best best read. What a great ending line. What a great ending line. Woof. Woof. Yeah, there's there's not a... 
There's not a lot of people who can be said to be as good as Paul Clement. It's a short list. There's like maybe two or three people you could mention in the same breath, but Paul Clement is one of the best. He's just so good. He's just so good. You know? Olsen might be one that you could mention in the same breath. Um, but it's a short list. He's He's just fucking good. I don't know. He's the Michael Jordan of Supreme Court, I guess, or something. It's just like there's no one better. No one can do it this well. He puts us all to shame. Uh, what was Olsen's first name? Um... Uh, or what is his first name? Uh, why can't I remember it? This is driving me crazy. Ted? Is that his name? Doesn't sound right. Might be. Theodore? Theodore Olson? That sounds right. Yeah, Theodore Olson? That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah, Theodore Olson, former Solicitor General of the United States. He's 83. He's he's really good. He's really good. Paul Clement is also a former Solicitor of the United States, and he's just badass. He's badass. And maybe in time, Prologar will get there. She's on her way. She's on her way. She hasn't hit the she hasn't hit the high road yet, but she's on her way. So maybe someday Prologar will get there, but it's not today. It's not today. She's she's good. She's good, but she's not Clement good. No one no one is. Can I provide an overview of Skidmore? Yeah, basically it just says that administrative agencies' views on the law should be taken with special consideration as the courts are trying to figure out what the law means, but those courts still get to decide, which is fine. Tim Riggs gets 50 gift memberships. Thanks. What are the odds Robert's managed to do Robert's things and limits to Kaiser rising and only brand X goes? I don't know. I mean, Gorsuch wants it dead. Gorsuch wants this thing dead as a doornail. And Thomas has expressed concern over it. And I don't know what the other votes are going to get like, but I really hope they kill Chevron and kill it dead. I really, really do. I pray that they do. Paul Clement's only 57. He's only like 14 years older than me. He is so good. Comes down to Roberts and Barrett. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. Paul Clement, when was he Solicitor General? In his 30s? It might have been. Yeah, so let's see. Let's see. He was born in 1966 and he was Solicitor General in 2004. So he was uh, 38 when he became Solicitor General. Yeah. He's, he's good. 
He's good. A Prologar isn't that old. Um, uh, yes, yeah, she's not old. Um, she's born 1980, so she's 44 too. So yeah, she's not very old. Tim Riggs gives ten dollars to save the hell with the bureaucratic state. So she's been uh she, she's been since twenty twenty one. So she became Solicitor General when she's forty one. So um, uh, you know, yeah. Tim Riggs says to hell with the bureaucratic state. I'm so absolutely sick of Congress shunting legislative and judicial authority on elected government agencies, and those agencies abusing it, running with it. Thank you very much. If there are five justices going against the agencies, he'll side with them so we can write the opinion. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Thank you for the 50 gift memberships, Tings. Tim, that's very, very nice. I appreciate that. Vivek can be present when he's 35. I mean, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, so she's done a lot in her life. Dems want gun banned, so they'll vote Chevron so guns can be banned. They're going to try, yeah. Hopefully the Republicans will have enough votes and actually kill Chevron. Now, if they want to kill Brandax and Auer while they're at it, that's fine by me. I don't see how Auer can stand with Chevron gone. But okay. I hope they just get rid of it. The Democrats will go crazy. They've taken more advantage of Chevron than the Republicans did. The Republicans saw it as their salvation and like many things that wound up being used against the people who created it. So this time it was the Republicans who fucked up and created something that helped them in the moment, but wound up burying them as the admin state got bigger and bigger. I'm not sure you can blame them. There didn't seem to be any out at the time. You know, there didn't really seem to be any out at the time. Because, you know, Scalia hadn't really popped on the scene yet, and I mean, this is 1970, so where this is all happening. So where the EP, where the DC circuit is kind of like going way out the reservation, so you can't really blame them in some ways because there didn't really seem to be any hope. But we are where we are, man. Yeah, the Senate took away the Senate rule on most judges, and that bit them in the butt. Yeah, so. Although, at least at the time, the Republicans were actively warning them it was a bad idea and would bite them in the butt at a later time. So I'm not sure anyone was warning the Republicans at the time. I'd have to go back. I'm not sure anyone was telling the Republicans at the time, you will regret this, but I don't know. Tim Riggs gives $5 to say government is almost always a problem, almost never a solution, and they can force the problems because they can cause with guns. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we will have a decision about this pretty soon. You know, by July. So four months. We'll have a decision probably sooner if I had to imagine. Prologar is getting close to conceding to losing our if it meant saving Chevron. Yeah. Yeah. She was willing to bend a lot to save Chevron. She knows she's in trouble. She knows she's in trouble. So she's willing to concede a lot to, to keep something of it left. She tried. She tried very hard to give the Supreme Court something they could work with. She tried to give them a compromise. She knows she's in trouble. She's smart enough to recognize she's in trouble. So she doesn't swing for the fences because she knows she can't get there. So she makes the very smart decision, in my view, to try to uh, to try to offer a more moderated alternative. You know, this is what a smart lawyer has to do. Smart lawyers have to be willing to give up things. 
because they know they need to find something else that can be worked with. She's trying to find a compromise that can work. And she tried, she tried, she tried to find a compromise that can work. And, but call Clem, Paul Clements like, well, the compromise doesn't work either. So Paul Clements like, yeah, the compromise doesn't really work because you have to get rid of brand X and the compromise doesn't really work. And we're just back in the same situation, but she tried, you can't blame her for trying. She came prepared. She came prepared as she could. She tried to find something that could work. Maybe the Supreme court will bite. I'm not saying there's no chance the Supreme court won't bite. You know, she made, she made, she made ruling for her as easy as she possibly could within the constraints she had to work with. So, but no disrespect to Prologar. I just don't agree as a matter of law. I think she's a smart lawyer, but I just don't agree as a matter of law. So I appreciate she's trying to find a middle ground, but on this one, I can't give it to her. You know, maybe some other case another day, but not today. Slimming down Chevron's probably more preferable than watching it blow into the water from her point of view. That certainly is, yeah. Yeah, she did a good job with the crap sandwich, yeah. You're having a hard time resubscribing on Twitch? I'm sorry to hear that. I don't know why that would be true, but I hope you are able to fix it. We do appreciate everyone who supports us on Twitch. Thank you, Red Rogue, for being a member for seven months. All right, I'm going to have a little bit more dinner. All I had was a grilled cheese in the 10-minute break, so I'm still a little hungry. So I'm going to make myself some more dinner. But I've really been appreciating the stream, and I hope everyone is appreciating the stream too. And thank you, Red Rogue, for the five gift memberships. Am I okay? I'm a little tired. I'm a little tired, so my energy level's running out. I'm also a little hungry. But otherwise, I'm fine. Thank you. I'm a little tired and a little hungry, but otherwise, I'll be fine. Am I going to do the other Chevron case? What other Chevron case are you referring to? What other Chevron case? What do you mean? Please clarify. Anytime we'll be fine. We wait and we wait and we wait and we wait. Wait and we wait and we wait and they might mean the decision. Of course, we'll cover the decision. There were two cases about Chevron the same day, were there? Uh, yes. You're right. Relentless versus Department of Commerce. Huh. It's like the exact same issue and the exact same facts. Why didn't they merge the cases for oral argument? Huh. Interesting. Because Jackson had to recuse on one. Oh, okay. So that one's two hours and 11 minutes. I can't do it now. I can't do it now because I'm tired, but we will try to pick it up next week. Yeah, I can't do, I can't do it now because I'm, I'm too tired. But yeah, they had basically the same case argued twice. This one was argued by some guy called Roman Roman Martinez. I'm not sure I know who that is. And Prologar presumably argued it as well for the other case yeah because they said well it's nice to see you again because she argued the earlier case so yeah interesting different yeah we'll, we'll we'll cover we'll cover it um we'll probably cover it on like monday or something thank you i i just kind of kind of forgot it existed i apologize 
Um, thank you. Which won't let you reset the day expires. I don't know about that. I don't know about that, but okay. All right, I'm gonna sign. I'm gonna sign off for now, man. Uh, is anyone? Recovery Addict still alive? Oh, I guess I'll send you that way. All right. Talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.